God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me as we begin in his word today? Heavenly Father, you have seen every age of mankind. There is nothing new under the sun. You have seen every empire rise and fall. You have seen every worldview and philosophy gain its start and, fl- and flutter out. Lord, you have, been, you have been consistent through all of human history. You've seen it all, Lord. And as we come to this text today, we are confronted with the fact that you and you alone are wise. We may think that we are but in comparison to the almighty creator, we are nothing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with us today, that you would open our eyes to your wisdom, which may look like foolishness. But I pray that you would show us the foolishness of the gospel this morning. Lord, we pray that you would be our teacher today. We cannot see you unless you open our eyes, and so we ask that you would help us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, nothing beats fresh squeezed orange juice. And I don't know if you had fresh squeezed orange juice lately. Uh, my children this weekend grabbed a couple oranges out of the fridge. They sliced them up and they grabbed that little like lemon juicer, the hand juicer thing. And they took all of those slices of oranges, put them in and just one by one created an ounce of orange juice in their cups. And they brought it to me and they said, dad, taste this orange juice. I just made it and I taste it. And you know what? It was amazing. My children made orange juice and it was so good because fresh squeezed pure orange juice is incredible. Go home and just, just do it, okay? It's really, really good. But I'm, I'm not sure if you've been to the grocery store lately, um, but the next time you're at the grocery store, you should go look at the orange juice section because humanity, in an effort to make orange juice more marketable and profitable and successful, has taken something so simple and added a ton of stuff to it to make you buy it. Next time you go to the grocery store, do this. Go stand in front of the orange juice section and just count how many options of orange juice you have to choose from. There there is an abundance of choices. It's overwhelming, to be honest. There's so many. There's uh, regular orange juice, right? Just the 100% all natural. We know it's not really probably all natural. Probably, you know, mass produced and it's got other things in it, but whatever, it says it. And then there's like the ones with calcium. And then there's the ones with iron added. And then there's the ones with extra vitamins that are added. And then there's home style and country style. And then there's all the different kinds of pulp varieties that you can have. You could have no pulp. You could have light pulp. You could have medium pulp. You could have full pulp. You could have heavy pulp. You could just go straight pulp and no juice. Like there's so many options of orange juice. It's overwhelming. And the Corinthian culture of this day was tempted to accept the content of a message based entirely on the packaging. Something that, you know, the American economy has learned and and learned about you, the consumer, is if we change the packaging, we might be able to get you to buy the contents. And that's very much how it worked in Corinthian culture. They were tempted to believe a message based almost entirely on how it was delivered to them. How wooing was it? How impressive was it? What did the packaging look like? Was it fancy? Was it elite? We think that we're above things like that, but we fall for it every single day. In the Corinthian culture, it was about rhetoric and style of a speaker, the wisdom and the logic of a speaker, the emotional roller coaster a speaker could take you on to persuade you and convince you of their message. And yet, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the Corinthians and planted the church that he's writing to, he came to these people with a very simple message 
stripped of all the fancy packaging. He just brought them the simple, pure message of the cross of Jesus Christ. He didn't bring it with eloquence or wisdom or rhetoric or fanciness or extra pulp. He just brought it as the message. He just brought the simple, pure message of the cross. And the people believed it. They believed in this message of Jesus. But as they started living life as the church, they started to slip back into their cultural values. They started losing their grip on the simplicity and the offensiveness of the gospel. And so Paul wants to bring them back to say this message that you believe, this people that you are, it's not reliant on the impressive values of culture. This message, you didn't believe it initially because it was packaged to you so perfectly and beautifully and said organic on the side, all natural. No, you, you simply believed this because of the simple, pure message that was brought to you and the Lord opened your eyes and you were saved. But now you're losing your grip on the gospel. You're saying that value, cultural values have to be attached to it or you're not impressed anymore. And Paul wants to bring them back. And we need to be brought back this morning as well. We need to be brought back every single day to the beautiful, pure, powerful, foolish gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in the section in verse 17, he said, Jesus did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, but to preach the gospel in a very specific way. Look at what it says. Not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And then he goes on to talk about the word of the cross. So as we get started, we have to ask this question, well, what is the gospel and what is the word of the cross that he has been sent to preach? Every single one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, need to be able to answer this question, what is the gospel? Heck, it's even in the name of our church. So you're kind of forced to be able to, you need to explain what is the gospel? What is it? The gospel is simply the good news announcement of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for sinners. And it goes like this. You could, we could tell this story in four parts. This is often how we teach one another to share the gospels. We share it in four movements, creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. It's the storyline of the Bible. The creation is, is this, is that God created everything and it was good. And he created man and woman in his image and they were good. And everything exists for the glory of God. But then there's something that happened. That didn't last for very long. And then there was a fall in which humanity rebelled against God. And Adam and Eve, as our rep representatives, disobeyed. And we would have too if we had our chance. Rebelled against the authority of God. Said, we don't want to follow your commands. We don't want to live with you in charge. We think you're holding out on us. So we'll take things into our own hands. We will be our own gods. And they sinned. And from that point forward, every single human being is a sinner by nature and by choice. And with sin comes judgment for our sins. This is part of the fall. This is part of the gospel story. That judgment is coming for all of humanity's sin. And that judgment, the Bible's very clear, is experiencing the wrath of God in a very real, literal, eternal place called hell which means there is a need for a solution. There is a need for a forgiveness to this sin. But God being a good and just God, like any judge that we know, can't just dismiss sin and wrongdoing. He must do something about it. And he does, and that's where redemption comes in. And he sends his son Jesus to live in our place and to die in the place of sinners. And in dying on the cross, Jesus doesn't just simply die a physical death. He experiences the wrath of God poured out on him for all of sin. And he bears the weight of our sins on the cross, receiving our penalty. And after dying, rises from the dead and says, anyone, anyone, no matter their background, no matter what they've done, anyone who will come to me, turn from their sins and believe in who I am and what I've done can be saved and forgiven. To not, they will not have this judgment for their sins coming for them because by believing in Jesus, all of their judgment will have been poured out on Christ. And then there's new creation, which is a promise to come that because of what Jesus has done, one day he is returning 
because he ascended back to heaven. He didn't die again. He ascended back to heaven. And one day he's coming back again to make all things new, to remove the presence of sin altogether and to make everything new and good again. This is the simple gospel message. I've heard a a helpful way of summarizing that whole thing as this, Jesus in my place. Jesus in my place. Paying the price for my sin. Jesus taking what only I deserve, which is judgment for my sin, and giving me what only he deserves, which is his righteousness. Gives it to us by faith. This is a simple message of the gospel. I'll even read for you what we say in um, our statement of faith together as a church. We say this about the gospel. We believe the gospel is the good news of what Jesus Christ has done to accomplish salvation for all who believe. The Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and as the substitutionary atonement in our place, meaning he paid the price for our sins, Jesus in my place, and salvation is found in none other than Jesus Christ. The salvation offered in this gospel message is received by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No ordinance, no ritual, no work, or any other activity on the part of man is required in order to be saved. Amen. Amen. The message of the gospel is is an announcement of what Jesus Christ has already done. It is not advice for how you should live. It is an announcement of good news that this has been accomplished for all who believe. That's the good news of the gospel. And Paul says that Jesus himself sent me to preach that to you without any eloquence. Jesus sent me to tell you that very news and to tell it to you without any of this fluff without any of the impressiveness, without eloquence. Or to them, they would have heard without wisdom, without your cultural Corinthian wisdom. Just simply that message with the invitation to repent, to turn from your sins, to turn from being your own king, your own savior in charge of your own life and believe in this Jesus. Believe that you can be saved not by the work of your hands, not by certain sacraments or ordinances or talking to certain people or priests, but simply by trusting in the finished work of Christ, you can be saved. That's what Paul has preached to these people. And he does it without eloquence intentionally. And he tells us why. He says, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. He's insinuating that there is a way to preach that message I just mentioned in a way that strips it of its power. There is a way to to share the good news of Jesus that removes all of its power. And it's actually not just a Corinthian problem. It's a modern day problem. There is a way to proclaim the gospel that adds so much to it or removes so much in the process that it actually is no longer the gospel. It's this temptation to think, well, if somebody's actually going to believe this thing, I kind of got to dress it up a little bit. I need to advertise. I need to change the packaging so it's more palatable to somebody if they're really going to believe it. And in fact, some of our country's most famous preachers, and I use that term very loosely, have done this with the gospel message to so water it down, to so make it palatable to people that you actually lose the gospel and it's lost all of its power and its proclamation. To say simply things like, no, Jesus just loves you so much and has a wonderful plan for your life. If you just kind of change a couple things about your life, he'll give you everything you've ever wanted and everything will be great. There are pieces of the gospel in that, but the power of the gospel is gone in a presentation like that. So Paul says there is a way to preach it that strips it of all its power. And it's when we change the packaging to try to make it so wooing, so impressive, to look so good to others that we remove the offense of the gospel. In fact, there are some preachers today, I would tell you their names, you can ask me afterwards, who will say, I will not talk about sin, I will not talk about judgment, because that offends people. 
And I'm here to just be an encouragement to them. To tell them, make a couple changes to your life and you'll have the Lord's favor. Things will go better for you. Friends, that's not the gospel. Paul says, I come preaching the gospel without eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now, why in the world would that be a temptation for some? Well, he goes on to tell us very quickly. In verse 18, he says, for, which is because, the reason why I said this is because the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Foolishness, absurdity, madness. The word of the cross is folly to those who do not believe it's the truth. In this passage, Paul's going to say there are only two types of people in the world. According to the Bible, there are only two types of people in the world. There are those that believe and those that do not. There are those that believe the gospel message of Jesus Christ is true and they follow him and those that don't. Paul says to those that don't, the word of the cross is foolishness. It is folly. Truth is, we very easily can forget how offensive and how foolish the message of the gospel is particularly the longer you've been in church, the longer you've been around the gospel, the longer you've been around this Jesus, you start to forget how offensive and foolish and silly this message sounds. The gospel is offensive to everybody. The gospel is offensive to everyone. Because the gospel says this, that you, no matter how good you think you've lived, no matter how many other people in your life you can point to and say, well, I'm better than them. You are destined to hell unless you turn from your sins and believe in this crucified God-man Jesus. That's offensive. No matter your background, no matter what you think, no matter what you've done, that is offensive. And there are so many that hear the gospel message and are offended and say things like, well, that's so narrow-minded. That's so intolerant to say that it is, that's the only way that someone could be saved, that someone could go to heaven is only by believing in Jesus. How intolerant of you, how narrow-minded, how not inclusive. When in fact, actually, everyone is exclusive with their message of how someone gets to heaven. Everyone is. Everyone draws the line somewhere. Most tend to draw the line of, well, generally good people will go to heaven and generally bad people won't. Well, there's, there's, some, there's exclusive lines being drawn right there. So only the good people can go and those that are bad, they don't get to go. Well, but then who decides what good is and what happens when we disagree on what is good and what is bad? Well, now we're drawing specific lines to be very exclusive when in fact the gospel message of Jesus says this, that Anyone can be saved, good or bad, rich or poor, powerful or weak. Anyone can be saved, no matter what they've done, if they believe. It's the most inclusive message of all time. Anyone can be saved, but only through the one Jesus Christ. In fact, the message of the gospel was scandalous throughout human history, not because of who it excluded, but because of who it included. The types of people that could be saved by Jesus. That's what makes the gospel offensive. Not who it excludes, but who it includes. To say even the world's most evil people could be saved, could be forgiven by this Jesus. That's the most inclusive offer I've ever heard. But initially, it's offensive. Because it says Jesus is the only way. And so there are some that will hear the gospel and say, not only is it offensive, not only is it intolerant, but it's archaic and it's cruel. How could you say that my sins require a blood sacrifice? That's so barbaric. In fact, let me read you a couple quotes from two different British philosophers. One uh, from the 20th century, Alfred Jules Ayer said this, the doctrine of the atonement, which is Jesus dying in our place, taking what we deserve. He said, the doctrine of the atonement is intellectually contemptible and morally outrageous. 
Bertrand Russell, another British philosopher, said this, no one who is profoundly human can really believe God would punish sins like this. And he called the cross the doctrine of cruelty. This is a very common way of thinking for those that don't believe the gospel. Because those that don't believe the gospel don't think that their sins are actually that big of a deal. And if you don't think your sins are that big of a deal, well, surely a man being sacrificed on a cross and his blood being the forgiveness of your sins would be offensive, would sound disgusting. The message is offensive. It says that this is what's required in order for your sins to be forgiven. It's a gospel that says you aren't self-sufficient. You need a Savior, which we hate to hear. Don't don't tell me I need someone. I am an independent man. I'm an independent woman. I got this. It tells us that our sins are really, really bad which most modern ears interpret as, well, that's not loving. It's a message that says that good people are in just as much trouble as bad people. It's a message that exposes our sin and no one likes their sin to be exposed. See, most people are generally okay with religion. I think most human beings will kind of recognize, yeah, religion's kind of of basically good, kind of helps people be kind and and moral, and, and most people are generally okay with religion. But Christianity is particularly offensive. Christianity is particularly offensive. Are you saying that I am a sinner deserving of wrath? That's your message? Are you saying that I need to be saved in the same way that every other person in the world needs to be saved, even though I am clearly seem to be better than them? Yeah, that is part of our message. But kind of missing the good news, if that's all you're, you're thinking the message is, that the good news is that Jesus Christ has come to take our punishment in our place and invites anyone to simply turn from their sins and believe. He doesn't invite anyone to simply turn from their sins and then have good obedience for the rest of their life and earn their salvation. No. Jesus did it all. And by by his grace and simply through faith in him, we can be saved. It is offensive. But it's also good news. Here's what Tim Keller says. He says, the cross is by nature offensive. We can only grasp its sweetness if we first grapple with its offense. If someone understands the cross, it is either the greatest thing in their life or it is repugnant to them. If it is neither of those two things, they haven't understood it. The gospel is offensive. The content of the gospel is offensive. Now, sometimes Christians delivering the gospel are also offensive. That's not what we're talking about this morning. You can be really offensive and rude in the way you share the gospel. That's not what Paul did. Paul said, I'm simply bringing the message to you, and I know that this message, the content of it, is foolishness to you. To those that don't believe, it's folly. The gospel is also scandalous. Culturally, we are so far removed from the first century, we've lost context for the scandal of the cross. Crucifixions to us are kind of just whatever. In fact, I bet that there's some of us here this morning that have a cross as a piece of jewelry around our necks. I'm not not saying that's bad, by the way. Don't feel, you know, guilty. But we're so far removed from this context that we can understand the cross as something beautiful. But in this day and age... It was awful. It was shameful and horrific. In fact, here's what Cicero says, who was, um, who was an orator during this, during this time, even before Jesus was born. Here's what he said about the cross. He said, the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. It's so disgusting, so shameful, so ugly, He says Roman citizens citizens not only should never be crucified, they should never think about it, talk about it, because of how shameful it is. 
And here we have a message that says the Savior of the world is a crucified Messiah. Culturally, that was a like deal breaker. That was offensive. That was scandalous. That was like you could not wrap your mind around that concept. Now, it's hard for us to do this because we've just lost this cultural connection. I think the only cultural equivalent, equivalent for us as Americans that makes us as uncomfortable or angry or offended or scared or appalled is probably the horrific evil of lynching in our country. Where white mobs would horrifically and humiliatingly target black Americans and murder them. Every single one of us, when we, we hear what I'm saying right now, feels uncomfortable. No matter who we are in this room. Because we understand that, that was really shameful, really scandalous, really wrong, really evil. We sit with that for just a second, we start to understand a little bit of how the first century felt about a cross. It's awful. It's horrific. And here we have a message that says the Savior of the world, your only hope of being saved is a crucified Messiah. Was offensive. Not just offensive like, silly, I'm not going to believe that. Offensive like, how dare you say that? That that's the kind of person I need to save me? Offensive. We've lost that. But that's the scandal of the gospel. And he goes on to say this. Because of those factors, this message is folly both to Jews and to Greeks. Because Jews, biblically, believed that those that were hanging from a tree were considered cursed by God. In fact, after they would stone someone, they would hang them on a tree saying they are cursed by God. Crucifixion was a hanging on a tree. So to the Jewish mind, you are now coming to them and saying, your savior that you need to rescue you from all of your sins because you're so sinful and evil is that cursed man who hung on a tree. And they'd say, how dare you say that? The Bible says that person's cursed. The gospel says, exactly. He became a curse for us. He took our curse on his shoulders. But Paul says, because of this very fact, Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews. They could not get over this concept of their Savior being a man that was cursed on a tree. It was a stumbling block to them. And he says this, it wasn't just Jews that were offended because the Jews said, show us signs of power. Show us miracles because that's what we've relied on all throughout our history. And then the, the Greeks would come and say, show us wisdom, give us the gospel, but show us the wisdom that comes with it. Impress us with eloquence. Give us this message, but we, we need to make sure that it aligns with my reasoning and my morals and my worldview. And Paul's coming and he's saying, you know what? No matter where you were at, whether, whether you're Jewish, whether you're not Jewish, this gospel is going to offend you. It's going to be a stumbling block to you. It's not going to fit in your categories. It's going to bother you because it's scandalous and it's offensive. So then the temptation is to think, well, then why not give them signs and wisdom in order to help them believe this gospel message? Paul, if that's your audience, if that's your context, why not, for the sake of helping them believe, bring some of those things? Surely, God has displayed signs and wonders before. Even the apostles have, are doing it all throughout the New Testament. They're providing healings and miracles in the name of Jesus. Why not bring some more of those? Or we know that God is wise and, and Paul can be winsome and he could impress them. And why, why not bring some of that to help them believe? Paul says no. Paul preaches the gospel to them in a way that doesn't lead them to trust it based on those things, but despite these things. He wants them to believe this gospel for the gospel's sake, not for the packaging around it. He wants the offense of the gospel to do its work. 
Because the truth is, we need to feel the offense of the gospel. That our sin is so bad and so unsolvable that this is what it took. This is what it took to pay the price for our sins. Why does Paul want that? Well, because he knows that that salvation is God's work. Salvation is God's work. It's not man's work. And so he preaches this offensive gospel because he knows the only way anyone will believe something so scandalous and so offensive is if God helps them believe, is if God convinces them this is true. This is what he, this is, this is what he does. He says this in verse 18, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, what is it? It is the power of God. So it's foolishness to those that don't believe, those that are perishing in their sins. And to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Notice what he says. He says, the word of the cross is the power of God for salvation. He's saying this, that the actual proclamation of the gospel, what's happening right now, I am telling you the good news of the gospel, that in and of itself is the power of God for salvation. This is how people are saved. They hear the message of the gospel like you are hearing it this morning and they respond with faith. They respond by repenting of their sins and believing in this Jesus. The word of the cross, the message proclaimed of the cross is the actual power of God. It's happening right now. This is how someone becomes saved. But how? Like, what's the deal with this message? How is it that this message can be so powerful? Why? Well, because it's a message of a crucified Christ. It's because the gospel is offensive that it's so powerful. It's because it's so scandalous that it's so powerful. It's so offensive to our human nature, no one could possibly believe it unless God called them to believe. You see, Paul comes and he preaches this gospel and he is not embarrassed by one sentence of the story. He's not ashamed of the scandal of the cross, the offensiveness of the gospel. He's not embarrassed that his Savior was killed. He's not worried about how unimpressive his speech is or how politically incorrect he is. He's not worried about how difficult this message is to believe. He heralds the pure, simple, offensive, foolish gospel. And in turn, he looks foolish. In fact, there's many that think that even the Corinthian Christians were embarrassed of Paul's speaking because it wasn't eloquent. He became a fool for preaching this foolish gospel. But if anyone believes it, it'll be all God. It'll be all him. It won't be because Paul was such a great speaker. It won't be because there were these great signs and wonders that accompanied everything. It will be because God did it. He says this in verse 21. He says, Since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Saying that it was God's wisdom to make sure that people don't know him through wisdom. You tracking with that? This is really good news because it means that anyone has access to believing the gospel of Jesus. You don't have to be wise. You don't have to be educated. You don't have to be elite. You don't have to even have to be smart. You could be a child who doesn't even know much about the world. That's the wisdom of God. To say the way in which the world will come to know me will not be through their wisdom. It will be through a very foolish message that no one would have created, that no one could have come up with. So much so that it says this in verse 21, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. That's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Think for a second. Think for a second about the things in your life that please you, that you love to do, 
because they bring joy and pleasure to your life. I wonder what that is for you. Maybe for you, that's being outdoors, right? Just being in nature, seeing God's beautiful creation. You just, that, that pleases you. You get filled with joy. Maybe for you, it's a really good meal and you eat a nice, good meal. You just feel so filled up with joy. Maybe for you, it's being with certain people, your friends or certain family members. And if you just be with them, everything's all right, no matter what you're going through. There are things in our life that we love that bring us joy. And don't you want to just fill your days with those things? Don't you wish you could just fill day after day after day with those things and not have to do all the other things that feel like they suck you of your life and your joy and your time? We want to fill our lives with these things. And Paul just said, it pleases God. The Almighty never needing anything, everything at his fingertips, God. It brings him pleasure and joy to save sinners through this foolish message. He wants to fill his days with doing this work. It pleases God to save us through this foolishness. Anyone who would believe. Anyone. It's through the preaching of the gospel that God calls us to believe. In fact, verse 24 says, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, they see that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Might God be calling some of you this morning to repent and believe? This is the way he does it. You want to know if God's speaking to you? He is right now through the proclaiming of his gospel. Might God be calling some of you here this morning to repent and turn from your sins and believe and trust and give yourself wholly to this Jesus? The gospel calls for a response because as the message goes out, what we just read is there will be two people, those that believe and those that refuse and will perish in their sins. The power of God is being extended to you this morning. How will you respond? Might God be calling some of you this morning to believe this message for the first time? All of this works this way for the glory of God. Look at how this ends in verse 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, there's a story in, um, in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. If you grew up in Sunday school, you probably heard this story at some point. It's in Joshua chapter 6. And the people of Israel, they come, uh, they're, they're trying to receive God's promises, but there's a problem is there's this big city that stands in the way of all that God's promised them. And it's the city of Jericho. And it has these fortified walls and the people of Israel are really no match for them. And God comes to the people of Israel and he says, okay, here, here's our battle strategy. I want you to walk around the city one time every day. That's it, just, just walk. They're like, God, what about like our weapons? You want us to like take those? Nope, just, I just want you to walk around the city. That's it, just walk. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll walk. And they walk around the city one time every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, God says, I want you to now do that seven times today. I really want you to get in your steps today, <laughs> right? Walk around the city seven times, and after you've done that seven times, I want you to, at the top of your lungs, scream and blow your trumpets and make noise. And for as weird and as strange as that battle strategy sounded, God's people did that and they obeyed him. And the moment they did that, God crumbled the walls of Jericho. God crumbled the walls of Jericho. And it still today remains for us to be a story that is true, but also tells us that was all God. It was so foolish, it, was, it had to be all God. It was so dumb, so not strategic that it had to be God that did it. 
It is the same with the gospel. It is so incomprehensible. It is so outrageous. It is such madness. It's such foolishness and scandal and craziness that if that's how sinners are saved, it must be all the Lord. It must be all Him, and it is. The only way that anyone is ever saved is all the work of God from beginning to end. He accomplishes what needs to be accomplished. He preaches the message to you. He awakens your heart to faith. He calls you to believe, and you do. And he keeps you till the end. It's all him. He deserves all of the glory. It's the brilliance of this gospel story. And Paul says it's the foolishness of God and the weakness of God. It's way more impressive and the wisdom and the strength of men. And I wonder, can we sit there? Can we sit there in the foolishness of God and the weakness of God and be satisfied? Because the truth is, is that if this is all true, it takes the pressure off of you. Not everything is riding on you. That's good news because you and I both know you're gonna fail. I'm gonna fail. I can't save myself. I can't be good enough. I can't even, I can't give, deliver this message to someone and, and it be impressive enough that they're going to believe it. But if this stuff is true, it takes the pressure off of you. Because it's all him. So Paul comes preaching this simple message, knowing he will never be accepted, he will never be exalted, he will never be renowned here on earth. And the same is true for us. We're not meant to be because as Christians, this is not our home. We won't find satisfaction and acceptance and renown here on earth. Find it in Christ, which means we can be ridiculed. We can be regarded as foolish. We can preach a crucified Christ because we know him. We'll close with this. The book of Hebrews in chapter 13 says this. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate of Jerusalem in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Such foolishness. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here on earth, we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. What this author is saying is that Jesus was crucified outside the city walls, which communicated he's an outcast. He doesn't belong. He's scandalous. Get him out of here. Nobody wants to look at him or see him. That Jesus was crucified outside the city walls as our Savior. Because he did that for us, let us too go outside. Let us be treated as those that don't belong here. Let us endure the same reproach that Jesus Christ endured. Let us be willing to say, this is not my home. Here I have no lasting city. For the sake of Christ and the message of the gospel, I can endure ridicule and shame and being called foolish here on earth because I have a city that is to come that's mine. That's the call for those of you here this morning that are followers of Jesus. Maybe you need to be offended again this morning by the foolishness of the gospel, by how bad your sins are, but then be encouraged by how gracious our King Jesus is. Maybe there's some of you here this morning that need to repent and believe and respond to this gospel for the first time because you never have. And God wants to save you. Maybe there's some of you here this morning that are being reminded that there are some in your life that need to hear the foolishness of the gospel without the pressure of adding all the fancy packaging, without having all the right answers to the follow-up question, but just delivering the pure simple, foolish gospel message of Jesus because it's the power of God for salvation. Let's pray together.